glad that you're able to be here in uh, in the Lord's house. We've been meeting in this in our uh, Family Life Center for a long time now, but we're glad to be able to, to meet together and uh, pray that the Lord would bless us as we uh, worship Him today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful today to be able to be here, and we're we acknowledge that you give us life and breath and everything we have. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, and we thank you for the gift of one another. Thank you for our church family. And we pray that during this service today that we would sense your presence, that you would work in us what's pleasing in your sight. You are our, our rock and our redeemer, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It is so good to see you this morning. Uh, a couple of quick things before we start singing. We are not going to stand again this week. And I just wanted a quick word of explanation. We're still trying to get the new video streaming equipment worked out. We're cutting them some slack this morning. You guys get to sit. But that means two things. Number one, you need to sing out anyway. Miss Bambi said she likes to hear you while she's playing. Okay, so keep singing. The other thing is um, I walked out and left my glasses. So I need to hear the words from you today. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if I mess up a few, just roll with it. It's what it is. So let's start out by singing Cornerstone this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy in Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. Sing that chorus one more time. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong through the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Let's sing, My Faith has found a resting place. found a resting place not in device or creed I trust the ever living one his wounds for me shall plead I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died my fear and doubt a sinful soul I come to him he'll never cast me out I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me is it the great physician 
good. I couldn't remember which words I sent to John, and I really didn't want to sing without you. Okay, here we go. The great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me, his <laughs> And like I said, I couldn't quite remember which words I sent to John. How about we sing, My Heart is Leaning on His Word, the very Word of God. Okay, here we go. My heart is leaning on the Word, the Word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through His blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough. This is the reading of God's Word, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much more gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And may God bless the reading of his word. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed, but so far this morning we have been singing um, songs about our foundation of our faith. Christ, a cornerstone of our faith. God, the resting place that we can have confidence in no matter what comes. And, uh, you know, this is, it's been a strange couple of weeks for our nation. And uh, I have thought over and over, uh, and honestly, I'm, I'm not watching the news that much right now. Take that for what it's worth. Um, but every time I do, I think to myself, I'm so glad that my confidence and my hope is not in people, it's not in government. It's not even in my car. My confidence is in God. He is our rest. He is our cornerstone. And even when things are not going the way we wish they would, it can be well with our soul. And that's how we're going to finish up the song service this morning. It is well with my soul. like a Nailed to the cross 
cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well. stand for freedom for Jesus took a sword and millions are in danger if they even speak his name but boldly they proclaim that we're the reason Jesus came we've got to tell
Thank you so much, Bambi. When the Bible speaks of speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, I thought of that as Bambi was singing to us, exhorting us to, to stand on God's Word in these, uh, these very difficult times. Uh, to further what Eric said just a, a little bit ago, I encourage all of us to be praying for our, our country, especially uh, this week. Free Will Baptists have called upon... Um, in our denomination, especially on Wednesday, to be uh, much in prayer. And so I hope you'll make that a focal point of your, your week. Not to give ourselves over to anxiety, but as the scripture says, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I want to invite you to take your Bible, if you brought one, and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we'll begin reading in verse 14, and we'll read down into chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. It is very warm in here to me. I don't know if anyone else... Amen. Can I get a witness? Thank you. There we go. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is God's word. Not too long ago, I came across, as I was going through some books, I came across a, a Bible that my Sunday school teacher, when I was in high school, gave me upon my graduation. And I think, if I remember correctly, I, I, I appreciated that Bible when he handed it to me. It was a, a men's devotional, it is a men's devotional uh, Bible. But I, I do believe that now I appreciate that gift as the years have passed. I appreciate it more today than I did then. I'm sure that you're like me over the years. Perhaps you've been given a Bible by someone. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher or perhaps it was through a group like the Gideons and the good work that they do. Or maybe it was a family member, a friend, a co-worker. Somewhere along the way, I suspect almost everyone here You've received the Bible as a gift. And there's no greater gift, by the way, that we can give someone else in this life than God's Word. But ultimately, the Bible comes to us from God Himself. The Bible, the 66 books that comprise the Old and New Testaments, what we call the Bible, the Scriptures, come to us graciously by the hand of God, as God worked miraculously as these men wrote, when they finished writing, they are, they're writing the very words of God himself. But why did God give us the Bible? Why did God give us the scriptures? You'll be glad to know that we don't have time this morning to consider all the reasons 
why God has given us the Bible, because there's a lot of reasons recorded for us in Scripture. But I do believe there are at least three reasons found in our text this morning, three reasons that God has given us the Scriptures. Or to make it more personal, three reasons why God has given you the Bible. And those are the three things that I want to share with you this morning, very briefly from the passage we just read. You've been given the Scriptures, first of all, for your foundation. You've been given the Scriptures, you've been given the Bible as a gift for your foundation in life. Now, this is Paul's last letter. As you read through it, it's very clear. We'll see as we get to the end of the sermon a little bit later that uh, he is anticipating leaving this life and heading off into the next uh, heading off into eternity to be with the Lord. And as he is getting ready to make this departure, he is uh, writing his last letter, and he's writing not only to the church, giving them instructions, but he's writing a very personal letter to Timothy, who was dear to him, his young son in the faith. Timothy now is a, is a young man, a young Christian leader, and Timothy has been raised up to follow the Lord by his grandmother and mother. As you go back to chapter 1, it, we learn about how his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice had been instrumental in teaching him the Scriptures. And so Paul, as we followed along just a moment ago, says, you've known the Scriptures from your childhood. And so his mother and his grandmother had drilled into his life lovingly God's Word, and, and now he... As a young adult, his mentor in the faith who disciple him, the Apostle Paul is about to leave this life. Paul writes to him about continuing in what he has learned. That's verse 14. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, or what you've been convinced of. It's the idea of, of, of a firm foundation. You've believed this from your childhood, now you're... A, a young man, and I'm about to leave, and I want you to continue what you firmly believed. The society around Timothy will not make this easy to continue in the Scriptures because the society, the culture at large, will be running in the opposite direction or, to keep with the analogy of here, building on a foundation, the society around Timothy, the people around him, are going to be building on other foundations. If you go to the beginning of chapter 3, if you still have your Bible open, Paul says, understand this, in the last days there will be come times of difficulty. Now, there are some places in the New Testament where it talks about the last days that seem to talk about a, a period of time at the very end of this age that will be intense persecution and a great falling away. But in, in my understanding of this particular passage, when Paul uses the phrase last days, know this, that in the last days difficult times are coming, that Paul is simply referring to the, the period of time between when Jesus went back to heaven, he ascended back to heaven, and the second coming of Christ. In other words, we've been living in the last days ever since Jesus went back to heaven. Otherwise, why would the warning make sense for Timothy? Know this, first of all, that perilous times are coming in the last days. We've been living in the, this age of the last days as we wait for the second coming of Jesus. But he tells him in verse 2, this is what's going to be marking these last days. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. In other words, this is going to be hard to be a Christian. The culture around you isn't going to make it, it's not going to be very conducive for your walk with the Lord. They're building on entirely different foundations for their lives. Verse 13 of our passage, right before we picked up reading this morning, says evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. 
And so there is a progression or a digression, however you want to look at it, at the evil in the world, people get, it's getting worse and worse. And certainly that's what we see in our nation today. But the transition in verse 14 is significant, but he says, but as for you. In other words, let me talk about, Paul says, what's going to be happening out there in the culture at large, by and large with people. But then he gets intensely personal with Timothy. You remember his son in the faith, and he says, but as for you, as for you, you see there's always a choice. Even when everyone else is headed in the wrong direction, even if everyone else is building their lives on unstable foundations, faulty foundations, as for you, Timothy, you have a choice. You can continue in what you've learned and been firmly convinced of, what you firmly believe. And so that's the question for all of us. Will, will you continue in what you've learned as a Christian, what you've been taught over the years in the Word of God? The Scriptures, Paul says to Timothy, he's reminding him of this, Timothy already knows this, but the Scriptures, Paul says, are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's verse at the end of verse 15. These sacred writings, the Scriptures, are able to make you, they have the power to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, the Scriptures are the unfolding of the plan of God. The Scriptures, the Bible, is the unfolding of the plan of God. In the Bible, we learn of our origin. We learn that we're created in the, in the image and likeness of God, that everyone's created in the image and likeness of God, but that we also have a, a serious problem. We're sinners. We've inherited a sinful nature from our parents, Adam and Eve. They pass it on to, to all of us. And so by our very nature, we go our own way and do our own things. We rebel against God's design. But God's plan all along was to redeem a people for himself through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. And so the Bible is the unfolding of his plan to save sinners and how he would do that. And so in the Old Testament, Jesus is anticipated... The coming of Jesus is anticipated through the shadows of the law, for example, or through the words of the prophets. They're pointing to the, the coming of Jesus, his arrival in the world. In the gospel records in the New Testament, his life is revealed to us, and the rest of the New Testament draws out the implications of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And the message of the Bible from, from cover to cover is salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That there is salvation in, in no other name. There's no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's through faith in Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and you shall be saved. When a person turns away from a life of sinning and they trust in the, the risen Lord Jesus who died and rose again from the dead on our behalf, the Bible teaches us clearly that salvation comes through faith in Christ alone. This is good news. And, and this is what Paul is, is underscoring and underlining in Timothy's life. Remember, as Paul is getting ready to leave, I'm out of here. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and been firmly convinced of. This is your foundation in life. You cannot improve on the illustration and the point that Jesus makes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. You remember that, I'm sure, when Jesus said, look, there are two ways to live. One man built his house upon the sand. The other man built his house upon the rock. Both houses, both families, as it were, both men faced the same storm, so to speak. They saw the, the rains come down and the wind blow and the, and the flood comes. And the only one left standing in the end was the one built upon the rock. And brothers and sisters, this is what the Bible is for you. If you build your life on this foundation, it is rock solid. Secondly, you've been given the Bible for your sanctification. You've been given the Bible for your foundation in life, but you're also given the Bible for your sanctification. Look with me in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3. Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God. You might have a translation, I think the King James says, inspiration of God, is given by inspiration of God. 
The Greek word that's used here is a combination of two words in the original, the word for God and the word for spirit or breath. So when you put that word together, it's literally God breathed. Paul says all scripture, all of it is inspired, God breathed, breathed out by God. So when we think about, we talk about in Christian circles, the scriptures being inspired, we shouldn't think of it in the way we normally might use the word inspired today. So we might say someone is inspired or motivated or moved to paint a painting or portrait. Or someone else is inspired, they're motivated to uh, write a love song to their, their wife or girlfriend or whatever the case might be. And in, in those kind of instances, maybe those are really works of art. They're masterpieces. But those things, those people are quote-unquote inspired to do today, they're, they're not perfect. But when the Scripture speaks of itself being inspired, breathed out by God, it's referring to this supernatural process where men were being moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. They're using their own writing styles. They're using their own personalities. They're actually writing. They're not in a trance. But God is working miraculously, superintending, overseeing the whole process so that when these men write their words, they're writing exactly what God intended, and it's without error. And so that's why Paul, out of saying all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, he goes on to say it is profitable. Because the Bible comes to us from God Himself, it is profitable. It is useful. What does he say it's useful for? Verse 16 for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. To, to shorten that down, in essence, what he's saying here is the Bible's inspired. It comes to us from God himself. It doesn't have any error in it. And it'll make you the Christian you need to be. It is given, like we talked about last week, with, we talked about growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. The Bible is given for our ongoing spiritual transformation. That's what sanctification is, this process where over the course of time, God is helping us to become more and more like Jesus in the way we think, feel, and act. And it's a, it's a process. There's the conversion, the point in time where you trust in Jesus and God's Spirit comes to make you new. But then we still have that old man inside of us. At least I do, and you do too. That's what the Bible says. We still have that old nature, and so we're in a process of spiritual change. We were converted. We're given new life, but then we still continue in this process of ongoing change. And how does God effect that change in our lives? He does it through His Word. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and He transforms our lives. That's why Paul says the Scriptures are useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training us in righteousness. The Bible, when it's correctly handled or interpreted, gives us sound doctrine. The Bible, as we honestly take it in, reproves us when we're getting off track. The Bible doesn't just tell us we're in the wrong, but God uses His Word to correct us and get us back in the path, you see. It trains us to be righteous. Verse 17 drives this home even further by saying, The Word of God is given so that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete or mature, equipped for every good work. The picture that's painted here is of outfitting you. Let's say you built a house and it, you had all the right dimensions. You know, the bedrooms were perfect dimensions in your estimation. You had the family room was just right, the kitchen. You had all the rooms built. The house was taking shape, but there's no furniture in the house, especially for your wife. Until you get furniture in the house, it is not a home, right? Until you get furniture in the house, it doesn't feel like it's livable. Now, for most guys, we could live in there without any furniture, right? But for, the, it, for, for it to be really a home and, and to start feeling like it ought to, you need to furnish all the rooms. And so it is in, in our lives as Christians, in order for us to be furnished or outfitted for life, to grow as we need to grow, we can't do it without the Bible. God's Word furnishes us. It equips us for the journey. Paul, in our passage, is really presenting us a teaching found in Psalm 1, where the psalmist says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Here's the picture. 
He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Spiritual prospering, spiritual transformation comes to us through God's Word. Thirdly and finally this morning, you've been given the Bible for your proclamation. You've been given the Bible for your proclamation. That's verses 1 through 5 of chapter 4. A simple command is introduced by a sobering reality. Verse 1, Paul tells Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Then comes the simple command, preach the word. Verse 2, preach the word. Preach the word. Now, when you think of the word preach, preach the word, or you think of preaching itself, you might think primarily of someone doing what I'm doing right now. And certainly, preaching would include, hopefully, what I'm doing right now, trying to do. But this isn't the whole picture of the word preach in the New Testament. No, preach in the sense that Paul uses it here is the idea of heralding something, announcing Heralds were used in biblical times in places like the Roman Empire to announce authoritative news to a group of people. They didn't have, thank God, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and 24-7 news. And so when news had to transfer to people from the king, they would use a herald. And so the, the herald would get the message from the king and he or... I suppose most of the time it was men, but maybe there were women. They would be sent out to a group of people and they, they would announce, they would herald, they would proclaim that news. And the news could be good, the news could be bad, but it was binding. It had authoritative power to it because it came from the king. The job of the herald, of course, was simply to proclaim the message, not to alter it or to change it in any way, but simply to share the message. The reason why this is so important for us as Christians when he says preach the word is because he tells Timothy, look, there are going to be people in the last days, you're going to see people in, in Timothy's day and ours that they, they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to gather around themselves teachers who tell them not what they need to hear, but what they want to hear. You see. I went to the doctor. I told you I had a doctor's appointment this past week. I went and, uh, you know, he didn't tell me everything I wanted to hear. He told me the things that I, I need to hear. But he warns Timothy here, people are going to gather around themselves, teachers who tell them what they want to hear. They have itching ears, and they gather people, pastors and people around them that tell them, tell me something that's going to fit my lifestyle. I don't want to hear anything that shakes up my life and tells me I've got to live differently, I've got to repent. No, tell me what I want to hear. And so the, the charge for Timothy is, no, you remain faithful. You stick with God's word. You be ready in season and out of season, when it's popular and when it's not. Your job is to reprove and rebuke and exhort with great patience and careful instruction. Again, I don't want you to hear this primarily in verse 2, preach the word as something only I'm doing. The message of the New Testament is we're all heralds. We're all to be proclaiming the message of the Bible to a lost world. Now, mail carriers, our mail carrier happens to be in, in, the, in the congregation, and uh, we appreciate our mail carrier. She is great at her job, and uh, I'm not a mail carrier, but in general, it seems to me at least, the main job, if you deliver the mail, is to deliver the mail. Yeah, I love going to the mailbox and, and pulling out, quote-unquote, good mail, Many of you gave us cards over the Christmas holidays and getting a, a card like that or encouragement, that's, that's, that's the good kind of mail, but none of us, I suspect, like getting the, the junk mail or a bill in, in the mail. But we've never, maybe you're weird in this way, we've never, when we've got the junk mail, the bad mail, we've never blamed our mail carrier, never blamed Melanie. Because we all realize they are simply doing their job. They are delivering a message that's been given to them, handed to them. It's, it's got our address on it. 
And that's the perspective we must have as Christians with the Bible. Our job, we didn't write the Bible, our job is simply to deliver the message. We have a, we've been authorized by the king of all kings to deliver the message that belongs to him that the world desperately needs to hear. As I mentioned from the start, there's a lot of reasons why God has given us the Bible. But these are three simple reasons that have the power to transform our lives. Three reasons why you've been given the Bible. You've been given the Bible so that it would be the foundation of your life. Is it? At this very moment, are you basing your life on the teaching of Scripture? Or are you building on some other foundation? Try to assess it honestly this morning. Are you building on this foundation or on something else? You see, in the end, the only solid foundation is the Word of God. As the hymn writer says, all other ground is sinking sand. You've been given the Bible for your sanctification or your ongoing spiritual growth, your spiritual transformation. Mere exposure to the Bible isn't enough. Though being exposed to the Bible is a good thing, the only way we're really going to grow is by absorbing the Bible by really taking it in in our heart, in our mind, in our inner being. And as we do that, we, we grow up in the Lord. You've been given the Bible so that you would proclaim its message. The question is, will you? We have the responsibility and the privilege to herald this unchanging message of the gospel. The message that doesn't change has the power to change people's lives forever, to change their eternity Will you proclaim its message? See, if we do these things, if we receive the Bible in these ways, if we make it our foundation, if we allow it to change us continually, if we faithfully proclaim it, then we'll be in a position like Paul at the end of his life. As he was passing the torch to Timothy, but as he was anticipating the life to come, in verse 5 he says, As for you, Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Timothy, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You see, right now, your faith is in God's word. But one day, that faith will be sight. Let's pray. Lord, your word is forever settled in the heavens and we need it to be settled and written upon our hearts and our minds. We live in, in very unstable days in our country, and we pray that you would settle us, establish and strengthen and settle us in your word so that we would be men and women of peace, men and women who exhibit the fruit of your spirit, that you work in us by your word, that our church would always stand on the truth, Help us not to be shaken in these days, but to rely entirely upon you. And Father, we do ask for our country that you would lift the light of your countenance upon it, that you would bring healing and reason and goodness and help in these days. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention. When you, are, <clears throat> when you are the associate in anything, you get to do all the fun things. And this morning, I get to uh, lead in our business meeting. Now, this will be short, depending on you, of course. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on this time. Father, we are so grateful today for all of those who are gathered together this hour. We thank you so much for our sweet 
people who love one another and who love you supremely. And we pray now that you'll give us guidance as we have this brief time of business. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask a couple of you guys, if you will, to pass out uh, for anyone who has not seen one of our budgets. They're back there somewhere. That's what the pastor gets to do. If you haven't seen one of the budgets, if you'll raise your hand, they'll get you one. We'll get to that shortly. Just raise your hand if you need a copy. But while they're doing that, we want to do our other item of business. It's customary for us at our business meeting, and you all have noticed that this year has been a little unusual. We haven't had many business meetings or anything else in normal order, but it's customary for us at our business meetings to receive new members. Now, we have a little different approach to membership than perhaps some, and it may be different from what you're accustomed to. But let me just tell you, if you would like to become a member of our church, if you'll notify our pastor or one of the associates and let us know, we'll make an arrangement to meet with you and go over some information uh, that we think you need to know. Now, that it's not the third degree, but we want, first of all, to be sure that you understand what it means to be saved. I started doing that years and years ago, and let me tell you that over time, when I asked people, have you been born again, I had at least three people who told me they didn't know what that was. And I was able to lead them to salvation biblically with an understanding of what it means to be born again. And we certainly want every member of our church to know what it means to be born again. Being a member of Bethel is a wonderful thing, but it don't take you to heaven. The new birth takes you to heaven. So that's the first thing we want to try to settle. And then we want to inform our people who are joining our church of some of our customs and beliefs. I told one of those who's going to be coming in this morning that I've always been afraid that we would have someone join our church and when foot washing time came, they'd say, what on earth is this? And we don't want that. We want to be able to explain to you some of our practices and our beliefs. So that's why we do it this way. Then having met with folks, we present them for membership at our business meeting. Today, we have three who have presented themselves for membership. They are Brother Wayne and Jeanette Wilson. We all, you all stand up back there and wave at us, will you? I think everybody knows them. Welcome them, will you? Yeah. <clears throat> they are Terry Gates' parents, and we're so happy to have them. They come here after a number of years of ministry a pastoral ministry, and most lately in Arkansas. Now, I can vouch for Miss Jeanette that she's truly a Christian. Brother Wayne, that's kind of up in the air just yet. We really appreciate them, love them so much. And then, thirdly, we want to welcome Melanie Ford. Melanie, will you at least raise your hand? She's... <laughs> I told her I was afraid that if I said, if all I could say is this is Don Perry's sister, we might not receive her. <laughs> but, but anyway, we need to have just a little chuckle along the way, especially during this time, don't we? Well, I'm not taking this lightly. We thank the Lord for them. Can we have a motion that we receive these into our fellowship? I have a second. All in favor, please say amen. amen. Those opposed, likewise. Well, thank the Lord. We welcome these to our fellowship. Now, I'm sorry if when you receive the budget, you haven't had much time to look at it. 
We did mention last week that uh, the budgets were available. I hope you got one. I hope you had an opportunity to look at them. Unfortunately for us, Brother Barney is not able to be with us today. He's not feeling well. But uh, if you have questions, we'll try to answer them. But before we do that, John's got a slide that Brother Barney prepared that we're going to share with you about our budget. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Brother Barney and Miss Linda. It's probably appropriate that Miss Linda is able to be here because she does all the work. But anyway, uh, we appreciate so much. I sent Brother Barney a note last week thanking him personally for all that he does. And by the way, he has prepared for you the uh, reports for your taxes. They're back on this table in this corner. They're in alphabetical order. If you'll pick one up, he has a record of all of your giving through the year. And folks, that represents an awful lot of work, I'm sure. So thank the Lord and thank Brother Barney and Miss Linda for the, their work. All right, uh, let's have a motion first to receive the budget. Uh, the way this happens is every year we have a budget committee, and this year being an unusual year, and we hadn't had a business meeting, we didn't elect new members to the committee, we just used the ones we had left over from last year. But this report is from the budget committee, and so can we have a motion to receive it, and then we'll ask for questions. To have a motion, a second. All right, are there any questions about the budget? All right, hearing none, all in favor of receiving the budget, please say aye. Those opposed, no. I hope that you will pardon my wanting to have a little fun as we've gone along, and thank you for your help today. Any other word? All right, let's pray. Lord, we do give you thanks today. What a wonderful year it has been in spite of all the difficulties. Your people have been faithful, and our needs have been more than supplied, not only as a church, but as a people, and we give you thanks. We ask that your blessing will continue to rest on us in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 